in a world where Nebraska has spent $28 million since 2005 to pay off fire coaches. There's a podcast called Blue Collar Sports Talk. And today, June 29th, they're going to bring you some Husker news. I'm about to let my heart speak. Friends keep telling me to leave They're going to recap the College World Series. They might even discuss some Major League Baseball. And of course, we have to give you our predictions for the AFC East and West. Again, they're going to be wrong. And now, here's their show Blue Collar Sports Talk. Hey, everybody, June the 29th. Welcome to Blue Collar Sports Talk. I've got James sitting across from me. Morning. And of course, it's uh, just the heart of Nebraska's summer heat and humidity. Uh, we did have a nice shower this morning, and uh, which just made everything even more humid. We love it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yesterday was brutal. So we'll jump into Husker News, and I pulled up a interesting, I think it was a couple of weeks ago I'd mentioned I came across some odds for overall wins for us, overall wins for, for Colorado. And it got updated for Colorado where the overs and unders are set at three and a half. But you have to spend 120 to win 100. So it's really closer to three, they're right. thinking. And for Nebraska, we're hovering around between six and six and a half, depending on what site you looked at. So I used VegasInsider.com, and it's like VegasInsider.com backslash college dash football backslash odds backslash win total. So, I mean, I rattled that off really right. quick. So every I'm sure everybody got that. But um, Vegas Insider. We're, depending on the site you look at, um, let's see here, which one is that one? That one is Caesar Sportsbook has our overs set at six, and they think that's really attainable. But then to get to seven, they think that's a little bit out of the realm because they they then put the odds out of reach when they go to six and a half. Okay. So it's, it's at set at six between six and seven for us and for for Colorado it's closer to two to three wins and I mean if you go back in time when the hirings happened there is a lot of Nebraska fan base was mad for not going after Dion Moore and blah 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 and <clears throat> they're going to do so much better in Colorado and blah 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 and here they are year one we're projected to probably get a bowl game and they're not even projected to you know be relevant at the end of the season. So I, I find that very funny. And I, I totally 100% agree um, with all the stuff on the side stuff that dion has got going over there in Colorado, self-imposed, not self-imposed. And then you got over here in Nebraska, whose rules just quietly doing everything correctly. And I just hope it 100%, obviously we got to know it has to translate onto the field, especially as Nebraska fans, what the last 10 years, the pre-train hype going all the way to August and September, we like, oh my gosh, we we we're gonna make it. We got eight, nine wins, right? And yeah, so I, it's got to transfer onto the field, of course, and uh, I think it will. We're I think we are doing a lot of the right things. So the silly person that uh, recorded our intro for this podcast said twenty eight million dollars is this spent, but actually, if you include Scott Frost's money that's been spent on fired coach, coaches, it's uh, closer to $32 million, I believe. Well, we bought him a nice house in Arizona. Oh, we really did. I should really go visit it. I mean, I helped pay for it. Yeah. I mean, we <laughs> ju just if you include Frost, that was $15 million we paid yeah, Frost. Nuts. And that $28 million that that was mentioned, that was between football and men's basketball head coaches. Yeah. So... The, the list is Bill Callahan, Bo Pelini, Mike Riley, and that's just the football guys. That was $16 million for those cats. Yeah. 
it's amazing. So why did I mention that? Well, Matt Rule, I really want you to succeed. Right. <laughs> At least I, for four or five years. I want you to succeed. I'm sick of us paying people to leave. Yeah. Here's your check. Please leave. Please go. So we can start all over and pay somebody else the same time we're paying you. We're pay, literally paying two coaches a year for, and not getting a bowl game. Right. Uh, which leads me to a John Wooden quote. Do not let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. And yeah. what Matt Rule can do is recruit. recruit. Oh, my. Him and his staff? Oh, my gosh. So uh, when I was looking into this a couple of days ago, they had 14 come in. Eight of those had already verbally committed. And, and I do. People hear me say the verbal commits I take with a very light grain of salt because all it takes is one little thing to switch them to somewhere else. But right now, verbally, Nebraska's getting these people left and right, especially the in-state, which is amazing. They just got tight end, that tight end Carter Nelson, uh, I believe is number four in the tight ends, top 100 guy, uh, to commit to Nebraska. Uh, obviously, uh, in-state move, huge, huge move. Got a couple of great wide receivers that uh, committed from local uh, from here in state, uh, the trenches, I think is where, obviously I talked about it last week. They got to build the trenches that grant bricks out of Iowa. I'm really hoping he makes it here. He's got a lot of big schools looking at him. Got a defensive end out of St. Louis. Who's got some pretty good, uh, schools going after him. But like you said, these guys have done their homework. You get, we're getting people committing left and right. Uh, I, I think Nebraska wins seven or more games. And if these commits stay and they sign in December and February, oh, man, I, it's definitely going to start being good times for Nebraska fan, football fans. I think it's huge that Vegas has given us the six, seven wins in Matt Rule's inaugural right. season. Right. So that, to me, that's a vote of confidence for what they're doing correct. And, right, we, we don't even have a quarterback that played last year. The offensive line is going to be very different. The D line is going to be different. You got a D, like I said, a whole new staff. And Nebraska looks so good on paper that they're predicting six wins, which is unheard of. That is unheard of. I mean, you have a new, you have a portal quarterback coming in, learning a new system, obviously. New coach, new system, defense, new system. You got the Syracuse guy coming on this brand new 3-3-5 that I'm really excited about. I love watching it. And, yeah, I, like I said, uh, everything must be looking good on paper because, they, yeah, six wins for that. S seeing what we've done the last seven, eight years, I, I'm, I'm shocked that the, it's not like four or five games. So in other Husker news, I wanted to mention um, the 99 Huskers name to Big Ten Distinguished Scholars. And there are 20-plus names on this list with 4-0 averages. That's huge. Not, not only are you dedicating your time to school and a sport, but you're also able to pull a 4-0. Right, yeah. So, I mean, you're not just getting through the average of, I just got to pass this test. You're just like, I am going to ace this test. Yeah. Wow. And I brought this up because there's one sad note for me. One of them is Ani Evans, who is actually transferred out of the volleyball. Um, but kudos to you, Ani Evans, for getting a 4-0. And we loved having you here. You contributed. You helped us get all the way deep into the NCAA volleyball tournament. And still wish you all the best of luck and continued success at your new school. Um. Speaking of college sports, the men's college world series, some, some have been calling it the best series that they have ever witnessed. And the only thing I would disagree with that is the first game was amazing. Uh, it, I mean, I'm not mentioning the pitcher duels, four, three game back and forth. It went, but the second game was a, a no doubter. I mean, Florida took off and ran with it. And then the third game same thing. LSU took the game and ran with it. I mean, literally the last six innings of both those games, did you even have to watch? Which I like the fans that were there. They got to see a lot of runs scored and, you know, some long innings. But 
as far as the best, I mean, if they would have been four, three, seven, seven, eight, six, four games, I would agree with you. But when you have a team that wins 24 to something and 18 to four, three, whatever it was, uh, come on, I can't say best series ever. Narrow version, I agree with you. And what I was alluding to was the entire College oh. World Series in, and and here's and here's some okay. of the and here's some of the yes. things that here's some of the records. So Florida's twenty four four winning game two was the biggest beatdown in men's College World Series finals history. Finals, yep, and the second largest win in any men's College World Series game. Eight games, eight games were decided by one run. And this tie to mark reached only twice in the 75 prior yes. series. So that's huge. Three teams overcame a three-run deficit or more. This tied, again, the most since the Men's College World Series moved to their new home in Omaha, right. just down the road. Um, 30, 30 home runs were hit. This is the most since two, uh, 2010. Um, 2010, they hit 32. And one of the big things when they moved was, oh, this can't hit them out of this park. The home run derby was a struggle, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the kids have yeah. adapted and they moved the, yeah. they moved the wall back or however you want to say it. It's, it's, it's yeah. Rosenblatt was small. Yeah. Imagine, if this, if that Florida LSU game was played at Rosenblatt, oh my it'd have been a 25, 30 ball <laughs> run ball game. Florida hit 17 home runs total that tied a record set by both LSU and USC in 1998. One that really jumped out at me. So Ty Evans plays for Florida. He hit five homers, and that set a uh, college world men's college world series record. This kid, prior to this, hit four all year in sixty five games. Yep. And the five he hit was the record. The previous record was four by a few people, all done at the old Rosenblatt Stadium. Right. He's the first one to hit this many. And the new new digs. Eleven guys had hit four, and that was again at the much uh, friendlier, <laughs> inner friendlier Rosenblatt Stadium. Exactly. Okay, so the Tigers won it all Monday, set one last record in the process. They had twenty four hits. That was the most hits of any team to participate in a men's college World Series game out of five hundred ninety two teams from nineteen forty seven through Monday night. And now LSU has their seventh title. Wow. Okay, so with all of that, I uh, I did a little research and I, I came up with some with some stats of other sports with crazy crazy scores. November twenty seventh, nineteen sixty six, the Redskins scored seventy two. Wow, seventy two <laughs> points. Right. NBA in a three overtime win. <laughs> three overtime win. Detroit Pistons 186, Denver Nuggets 184. That was 1983 yeah. in Denver. And you know, on that, it doesn't surprise me that Denver is part of that. It really surprised me that the Detroit Pistons were part of an 180 point game. Well, this was 1983. No, I, I'm with you. That's I, I still, that, that's still early pre bad boy era, but. If you look at those players, they weren't. Yeah. But also yeah. three overtimes. Three overtimes, yeah, it did help. Three overtimes. Major League Baseball, August 22nd, 2007. Rangers 30, Orioles 3. Yeah. Now, now this one, this one goes all the way back to 1920. 1920. Montreal Canadiens, 16 goals. The Quebec Bulldogs, 3. Oh my goodness! Sixteen. You, you know how in baseball where you where the game's out of hands twenty to three, and then they start bringing in the outfield guys to pitch. Yeah. Do you just take all your goalies out and just put a center or somebody? Hey, Billy, yeah. just go see if you can stop a puck. Right. This right. is just out of hand. So I wanted to include your Red Wings in this because they were one shy of the record in nineteen forty four. New York Rangers null zero zip zilch. Detroit Red Wings. 15. Ooh. That was a beat down. Man. That clock couldn't go fast enough for those Rangers. Right. College basketball. In an NCAA tournament, Loyola Marymount 
won 149 to 115 over Michigan. That is that at that time that was the highest scoring in March Madness. And this was this was a uh, I believe a multiple overtime game, seven overtime game in college football. Texas A and M. I'm yep. sure you remember this. Texas A and M seventy four, LSU seventy two. November twenty fourth, twenty fourteen. And that caused a new change to the football rules. Before it was, you know, you kicked extra point or whatever. Now it's after it's just go for two. Yep. You know, just the two point conversion things instead of running the plays every time from the twenty five. So that game pushed the rule change. And so that was twenty eighteen. Two years prior, that was um, 76 to 61 by Pittsburgh against Syracuse. So y'all can put up some points. Now the all-time record, and this was a huge lopsided game, this goes all the way back to 1918. Georgia Tech scored 118 points in a football game. And poor little old Furman oh. scored zero. <laughs> So that, that's, that's your trip down memory lane with some records on some crazy, crazy scoring games. And uh, I will agree with you. Uh, as an overall College World Series, all the teams from start to finish, yeah, we were talking about it at work during the weeks, how each game was just nuts. It was awesome. And, and that's yeah. what I was trying to look yeah. at. The, the whole series, not just, okay. not just the finals. Yeah. The whole College World Series from start in, in Omaha to the end, yeah. Some old, some old timers, some old time coaches that have played, some old timers that have that have come back that that played when they were kids. Think, wow, this is one of the best that we've yeah. seen with with all these comeback wins and all the excitement. Yep, and Florida outscored LSU thirty one to twenty six, I think, something like that, and and still lost. Yeah, you you know you can't put all your eggs in one game. So, yeah, again. A lot of scoring. The good thing is a lot of scoring. They had the one pitcher's duel with uh, LSU Wake Forest, which is an amazing game. All the record-setting strikeouts that the pitchers put in there. Both are going to be top five picks. And coming up on this Futures game we're about to talk about, they'll be in, you know, probably in next year's Futures games. We might get to see them then. Yeah, they were talking about the amount of future draft picks that showed in this College World Series. It's so much talent. Just in the Florida uh, LSU series i think there are seven eight of them that are in the top 25 so that's pretty good so you mentioned it we're going to move to major league baseball a little bit here um we talked college baseball so sticking with a husker theme schwellenbach remember spencer schwellenbach was a shortstop and pitcher Mm -hmm. um he got picked up what was that uh second round in 2021 he's been playing for single a augusta which is part of the Atlanta Braves organization. And part of the Major League Baseball All-Star, I'll call it week, that's coming up here in uh, in July, they have what's called a futures game. And he is the fourth former Husker. We've had Jamal Strong play in this futures game 2001. Alex Gordon played in the futures game 2006. Jabba Chamberlain played in the futures game in 2007. And... All three of those eventually reached the majors, and they think Schwellenbach will also reach the majors. So huge feather in your cap, Schwellenbach, for getting chose to play in the Futures game. And I wanted to bring this up. The The Major League Baseball all-star schedule it is kind of around the corner. Tonight, the 29th on ESPN, they're going to reveal the starters, the Major League Baseball all-star starters. And right now you have the two that were locked in. Your two biggest vote getters were uh, Otani, Shoei Otani, who definitely deserves it in the American League, and then Asuna for the Braves. They're already the shoe-in starter captain people as they led their votes in uh, the National American League. And the All-Star game actually happens July the 11th. That's on Fox. Um, They have the Home Run Derby July 10th. That's also ESPN. And they have that silly All-Star celebrity softball game following the Futures game on July 8th. Um, Another mention of a guy who was recently called up from the minors, Cincinnati Red, is helping his Cincinnati Reds team just have an amazing season. And that's Ellie De La Cruz. He recently made history for being the youngest 
to hit for cycle in 51 years as the youngest Major League Baseball player to have ever done this. Yeah, and to get called up like he did and contribute right away on a team that is starting to put some wins together, that's, that's huge. And the, the kid's got power. Oh, my goodness. When he hit for cycle, he doubled to open the second inning, had a two-run homer in the third, hit a run-scoring single to center in the fifth, and then tripled in the sixth for his fourth RBI of the night, which also helped increase their lead to 11-7 to and eventually helped them beat um, the Braves that night. That, that, was, uh, that was a few weeks ago, June 23rd. No, not just a few weeks ago. That was five days ago. Right. Five, six days ago. But huge. Yeah, getting called up and then to hit for cycle and it's is oh, just on a tear. Yeah, definitely. It. I mean, you got guys that play seasons after season, don't even get part of a, you know, three of the, of the four. And this kid came in and does it already. And, you know, of course, Red fans are like, Give me more and more and more. So yeah, I'm I'm excited for his future. Uh, hopefully, he gets to stay up and and it's hard not to let all the uh, fame go to your head. I guess not necessarily fame, but you know all the accolades go to your head where you don't put in the work. But he only got there from putting in the work. You just keep putting in the work. Yes, you do have to put in the work. That that makes me think of a Muhammad Ali quote. I know it's he's he wasn't a baseball player, but. He said, I hated every minute of training, but I said, don't quit. Suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. And it doesn't matter what sport you're in. That's huge. Yep. Um, I, I, okay, so I, I have to give you two more baseball quotes, and I, I found these interesting. The first one is Sandy Koufax. I became a good pitcher when I stopped trying to make them miss the ball and started trying to make them hit it. So... For any anybody out there that that is uh, trying to make it as a pitcher, yeah, I, I mean, R Riviera, New York Yankee, he yeah. was great at that. Right, it you know it's coming over the plate. I just got to try to hit this thing that's apparently moving and cutting and drifting and yeah. And and Satchel Page had an interesting look outlook on it. Just take the ball and throw it where you want to. Throw strikes. Home plate don't move. Right. And I've heard that numerous times. These young pitchers will come up and they have so much movement on their ball and they'll try to paint a corner. And I've noticed that the catchers, they were saying the catcher's like, no, no, no. I want you to throw it to the middle of the plate and let the ball move to the corner. Don't try to spin it to the corner. Throw it in the middle of the plate and it'll move. And yeah, if a, a batter's sitting there thinking, okay, this is coming middle in or whatever, and then it breaks out or breaks down, that's what keeps... Uh, you know, let's roll into it now. Uh, Armand pitched that perfect game last night. Oh, man. And his off-speed, his curveball, it was it was literally like he looked like he was, I only got to see the last two innings because I worked right down the middle, but they are late breaking. They are dipping. Oakland couldn't catch up to it. Uh, you know, fourth perfect game in Yankee history is the first one since I want to say it was 98 or 99 when uh, Cohn threw his. Wells pitched one, then one year and the next year was Cohn. And then, yeah, so this first one since 2012 when uh, Hernandez pitched, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Felix Hernandez for Seattle pitched a perfect game. So it's been a while since Major League's in a perfect game, and Erman pitched a gem last night. For, uh, the first pitcher born in the Dominican Republic, and he's the first one to pitch a perfect game. The, the stat that jumped out of me on his perfect game was his pitch count. Yeah. Right at 99. Yes. He didn't even need 100 pitches. He yep. got it done at 99. Yep. And when I started watching, so back in the day when I was young, when the announcers had a perfect game or no-hitter going on, when I remember, I watched David Wells, I watched David Cohn's perfect games, the announcers talk about everything but the perfect game. They start talking about, you know, somebody's bad and average or the fielding and this and that because they don't want to be the jinx. Well, the last couple of years, the announcers, not even just the Yankee ones, everywhere on Fox, uh, Bob Costas, another one. They will talk about it nonstop from like 6th, 7th inning on. You know, start bringing up who had a no-hitter, when the last time this was, and last time he had this many pitches, or he's ahead of this, or whatever. And I'm like, you know, it's like the field goal kicker. Oh, he's made 27 in a row, and he misses. Oh, you jinxed him. Announcers have now, I guess, thrown that out the window. I'm not jinxing him, but I'm going to talk about it because it's history. And they did. I mean, when I turned the game on, 
And he talked about the the whole time. And it was, even when they're batting, so the Yankees come up in the bottom of the, I'm sorry, the top of the ninth, scored two or three more runs. as like a 12-minute inning. And they're like, oh, he had to sit, you know, just over 10 minutes. He's going to have to come out, you know, see if he can still. It's like, dude, don't make excuses for him. He's a Major League Baseball player. He's got this. So more than a month ago, he was suspended 10 games for using too much rosin. And he wanted to apologize to his teammates for doing that, and he was going to use less rosin. I think this game apologized to his teammates. Right. Well, what's funny is after he came back, he the game before this one that he pitched, he pitched 93 pitches, 10 earned runs, 10 hits, gave up four homers and in four innings. So, and then to flip it and do this, yeah, that's, that's uh, it just shows that Boone and the Yankees know he has good stuff. Now it's just a matter of him getting dialed in and quit being suspended and missing games where he can get into the flow. So, well, and that's, I brought that up because I think that rule is a little tic tacky. You, you can, you, you can interpret it so many different ways. And he got suspended for using a substance that they allow you to use, but it was just too much. And, and mixed with his sweat, they said it was too sticky. It was actually pine tar. Well, I yes. know. That's, that's right. one version. <laughs> His version is he was using rosin right. and mixed with his sweat. Yeah. How, however, it's, yeah. it's your story, whatever lie you want to tell, that's great. Right. And the only reason you know it's pine tar is because you saw in the video when I was watching the game, I was watching one and he got suspended, or when they took him out, he'd wipe his hand on his shirt and you can see the dark darkness of the pine tar. And pitchers are doing that because these balls are so slick. So they're trying to like just get a little stick on their hand so when they wipe the ball they can actually grip it and put the spin on it. Right. And he was already warned once early, early in the season. The umpire was like, dude, go wash your hands. That's too much. So he did. Well, the one that suspended him was the same guy that told him a few weeks earlier to go wash his hands. So this time he looked for him, checked him. He was like, dude, I already gave you a warning. You're out of here. <laughs> so I, I, the, the ump was the least nice game warning the first time. Second time, now you're cheating. So, but yeah, what a great comeback for him. Uh, and actually only the third born outside of the United States of those 24 perfect games in the Major League Baseball. He's only the third player born outside the U.S. That's huge. Congrats. Congrats to all you Yankees fans and congrats to anybody who likes a pitcher's game because that was, if you like a pitcher's game, that was that was a fun game. And I do realize it's Oakland, who's one of the worst teams in the baseball, but no one else has no hitting them. But Oakland has a distinct history or whatever you want to call it. They have thrown two perfect games. They've also had two perfect games thrown against them. I, you know, eh, eh, eh. That but, one side of the stat sheet you don't want to be on. Right. So, yeah. <clears throat> we are going to flip the page, and we're going to give you some of our best guesses. And... We are focusing today on the NFL AFC East and West. I will let James pick. Where do you want to start? Uh, I, I think let's go West first. Okay. I think that's pretty much down to two teams. The East, I think there's a safe argument for three. I don't think there is, but I could entertain the argument for three. But yeah, let's go with the West. Uh, mainly it's going to be, you know, Chargers, Kansas City. All right. We're going with West and then... Do you want to start in the basement, or do you want to start top? Yeah, yeah, let's start down, and we'll work our way to the, the winners. All right, take it away. Uh, I I have the Raiders um, at the bottom. They have a lot of turnover over there. Main thing is they got Garoppolo coming in as their guy. Nothing against Jimmy G uh, besides health. I, you know, that's huge. Uh, you got to stay healthy. He's coming off a foot injury. Uh, I, I, I don't have a lot of faith in McDaniels as a coach. Um, their running back is franchise tagged. He's yet to sign it. Is there potential of him sitting out? Who knows? Um, I, I think as a team that's not quite ready, even though on paper they look really good, um, I think they're going to be odd man out. And it won't be by much. Denver will be sitting right there with them at the end. Maybe one or two game difference. It might even come down to their head-to-head -head matchups or who finishes third and fourth. Yeah. Vegas. Um... Wolf. Um, I have them. I have them winning four games. The Raiders. Yes. Yeah, I can't really disagree there. So in 
2022, they finished six and 11. Sports Illustrated predicted them to win five, go five and 12. Um, ESPN has it way off. They, they have their win total, their under set at seven and a half. Well, yeah, that's the easiest bet all year. Yeah, they're right. gonna they're gonna lose a lot, so I think four is an easy one there. Um, so yeah, so then so Denver, I have Denver finishing with six wins and one tie. Oh, with the Raiders. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I I think they might be the one team that'll get six and one tie. They finished five and twelve last year. All new coach, all new stuff. All, they're they're hyping. Oh, Peyton's gonna help Mr. Russell. Right, is he? Yeah, and I've been reading also that oh, Russell's playing great, and a couple coaches are like, oh, everybody's gonna have to eat crow. Get hit one bad year, and everybody was down on him. And blah blah blah. I'm like, you can say what you want. You still have to play the Chargers and Kansas City twice. Yeah, there's four losses for both them, those teams. You know, and then some of your outside of the conference play. And, oh, and you play each other. So did you, if you one and one, there's five losses right there just in your conference. So Sports Illustrated has them about at seven, seven wins. And then ESPN set the over unders at eight and a half. Oh, wow. They're, they're, that, was a, that was a stretch. Yeah. They love Sean Payton. Oh, well, and that's fine. Well, what's not to love? And everything I read is they're, they have a great running back that they drafted that's, that's supposed to be great. You guys haven't even seen him in pads yet. Right. He, and he's undersized. Yes. He's not even 180 yeah. pounds, I don't think. Yeah. And, I mean, they made some nice little moves on the receiver trying to help. I, and you're right. Champagne's a great offensive mind. They already have a really, really good defense. It wasn't enough, and it won't be enough. Uh, to me, the Chargers loaded up. I have them finishing third. Uh, grabbing Kellen Moore from Dallas, not grabbing him from Dallas, but Dallas let him go. Chargers picked him up. Herbert was has already the youngest quarterback to throw for whatever thousands of yards by this time in his career. He already has 90-some touchdowns. Also the youngest quarterback to do this in this short of time. And now you bring in Kellen Moore, who, oh, by the way, had Dak putting up 30 points a game. So, And Herbert, yes, is definitely a better quarterback than Dak Prescott. So... Uh, it, it's going to be tough. This team was already right there. And now if you have an offensive coordinator that's not the head coach, because that's the way it was before, he's going to give the play calling away. Man, uh, I'm not, I'm, I can't knock off the Chiefs yet, but I can definitely see the Chargers splitting with them one and one this season and really pushing them for that division. Chargers finished 10-7 and seven last year. Sports Illustrated predicts them to finish exactly the same, 10 and 7. I'm right there with them. I think they'll go 10. ESPN has their over-under set at 9.5. The interesting thing is if you get a couple key in injuries, right? Yeah, you, this is you, you never know. Yeah, to me, it's, it's a strictly no injuries, obviously. The other thing, though, to look at is, okay, so this is a team that's moved, and it's now in L.A., all right? L.A. is a weird town because you have so many teams represented by their fan base out there. So fans in L.A., when you host the Chiefs, when you host the Raiders, you also see the Cowboys in L.A. and the Bills come to town. You also have a chance for the opposing team fans to be as loud Yes. As your own fans, because it's L.A. Fact. So, yes, I think the Chargers can get to 10. And the unfortunate thing is if just a couple of things change, that can really drastically change your your season. And I agree. I think Kellen Moore coming over as offensive coordinator is huge. Um, speaking of offensive coordinators, the slide to the Chiefs. Are they the same without Eric Bieniemy? Are they better? Are they worse? What do you think? Uh, I does think it, there's does the it same. matter? Yeah, I don't think it matters right now, mainly because uh, the head coach there is still there. I can't think of his name right now, of course. Uh, but he's still there. Reed. Reed, thank you. Um, as long as Reed's still there, he's the main engine. He's the one that, you know, they've even come out that he's the one that puts a lot of the game plan together. Him and... 
uh, Mahomes are on the same page. You know, being even calling in the plays that are already preset for different situations. I don't think that, you know, somebody else can do that. But with Reed and Mahomes still there on the same page. And Mahomes is an X factor. I mean, he still has Kelsey. Uh, kind of changed the receivers. They've lost a couple of D linemen. They lost an O lineman I know of. Uh, the running back thing's kind of iffy. They have good ones that come in. This Hilaire guy from LSU did really well. Injuries and then back. Uh, I think they need to start relying a little bit, not relying, but starting to use that running game a little bit more to so the play action works. Because right now teams are like, we're going to let you run. We need to stop Mahomes and Kelsey. So, But until they do it, I mean, he played with one foot and beat Cincinnati Bills. And then he comes in and plays Cincinnati with one foot. Cincinnati couldn't blitz him correctly, and he wins that game. Then you go in the Super Bowl, somewhat healed, but still on one foot. And the Eagles couldn't beat him, who had this amazing pass rush. And oh, by the way, no sacks. So as it wasn't that nuts. Yeah, I was totally confused. I would if I would have made it to a casino, I would have lost thousands of dollars. But it just to me it shows that Reed game planning and Mahomes execution until that's broken up. I, yeah, I think Kansas City wins this. I, I still see the Chargers winning 11, 12 games. I'm looking at their schedule. I mean, uh, the Vikings, I, you know, they can win at the Vikings. They got the Titans on there. The Cowboys' bills will be tough. Uh, the Jets and Lions, I think, is 50-50 game. But, I again, I, I do think the Chargers win up there and push Kansas City, who doesn't have an easy schedule of their own, since they're playing that first-place schedule. So they're going to be playing a lot of those first-place teams also. So... The Chiefs obviously won the Super Bowl last year, finished 14 and 3. And Sports Illustrated predicts that they'll finish the, the exact same record, 14 and 3. ESPN has their overs under set at an 11 and a half. I, I agree, unfortunately, with ESPN at this time that I think 12 might be their ceiling for 23. It's it's not it's not a bad record. I no. I still think that that wins them the West, and they're going to be one of the best in the AFC. I just feel that there's other teams that are have the ability to challenge them on their schedule. Right, yeah. And and it's a grueling schedule. I mean, when you're playing is. a first-place schedule. And, you know, one thing I look at, if, I, if I'm if i saying mine, Chargers and Kansas City split one, that's one less win for Kansas City, knocks them down to 13 and puts the Chargers at the 11-12 mark. So, I again, I think they knock on the door, but Kansas City will win the division. And the, once again, the Raiders and Denver will be on the outside looking up, not making the playoffs, of course. Over to the East, we have, uh, I'll start in the, in the cellar again, the Patriots. The Patriots, last year went eight and nine. Sports Illustrated has them predicted winning seven. ESPN set the over-unders at seven and a half for their win total. I, I think they'll match last year's eight. I think they'll go eight and nine again. Um... Yeah, I, I won't disagree. I do have them in the cellar also. They went 3-3 three and three in the division, uh, winning the Jets in a Miami game that they probably shouldn't have won. I, I, they they haven't gave, have not given uh, the quarterback out of Mark, Mark Jones. Yeah. Any help. I mean, they got Schuster, but then they lost their, one of their better tight ends, picked up another guy. Uh they did change the offensive coordinator. They brought in O'Brien. So supposedly it will be more of an offensive mind running the plays. Their defense is a Bill Belichick team. Their defense is going to be great. Um, but offensively, I, I've, you know, Jones and Zeppi are really good quarterbacks, but neither one of them put fear in the other defense. I Yeah, eight wins, I guess, but they are going to have to really come outside that division because honestly, I don't know if they can beat any of the other three. I don't know if the Jets, Miami, and Buffalo even lose a game. And if it is, it's one, right? Maybe Miami or the or the New York. I don't see Buffalo losing to. Yeah, I don't. I think it'd be tough for them to go eight. I mean, last week, last year, Buffalo's four and two in the division. Miami, New England, three and three, and Jets are two and four with injuries and all that other stuff and Jets without a quarterback. So now Miami supposedly is all in with Tua, healthy. Jets, you have Aaron Rodgers. So that two and four division probably flips to four and two, which puts 
New England in the one and three range, you would think? Yeah, and you, okay, so backing up, we were trying to think of their quarterback. You said yeah. Mark Jones. It's Mac Jones. Mac. Ah. Right, right, right. And I, and I agreed you. with you. Thank I was you. wrong. The one piece that could help a lot, but you don't know if they'll get on the same page with the quarterback, is bringing over Hunter Henry as the tight end. Yeah. And well, injuries. And injuries. Right. Yeah. Right. So Juju Smith-Schuster is questionable to start the season. Do they get on the same page? Devontae Parker, does he have a breakout season? Um, so I, I don't, I just, that's, it's, it's a big question mark. Yeah. And again, you know, the defense is going to be stout because that's what Belichick right. prides himself on. I don't necessarily think that O'Brien is the answer for your play calling offense, but that's what he decided agree. to do. Right. <sighs> yeah. And in, in, in this conference, but I also have to say this, you have not been the same since Tom Brady left. Fact. He was your offensive coordinator. He had a wealth of knowledge. He had all that experience. He knew what to do every down. And I can almost guarantee that 80% of the plays that were called, Brady went, let's do this instead. Well, and Brady... Or he like, called them all. Well, like Brady, Manning, them guys saw the defense, already had the two plays in their head. You know, you see them audibling at the line because they know what was going to be open against that set of defense. Matt Jones doesn't have that yet. But Belichick, being as stubborn as he was, he goes, all I need to do is play good D, hold them to nine or, ten, nine or ten points or less, and we'll get a defensive turnover, and my guy manages the game. Well, that, it showed last year that doesn't work. Last couple of years, obviously, it doesn't work, and yet it looks like that's what they're going to go in again this year. Yeah, I don't, again, yeah, I don't think O'Brien makes a difference. Uh, they're going to finish in last. Uh, then all the chirping at the end of the year when they don't make the playoffs or even relevant the last four or five games, does Belichick keep his job? Do you fire a Super Bowl coach that's won five or six Super Bowls? Or do yeah. you just tell the GM, hey, we need a new quarterback. This isn't the guy. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't I don't see, I think he's too much of a uh, household name or whatever you want to say, a legend in New England. I don't know if the New England fans really want him to be fired. I think they probably just want Jones out. No, I get that. So looking at last year's schedule, so they lost a close one to Buffalo in Buffalo, and that was 35-23. They lost a close one at home to Cincinnati, 22-18. But they also lost games like at Vegas, 30-24. to Right. They... They give up 30 to a Vegas team. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, they beat the Jets. A lot of people beat the Jets last year. Mm -hmm. They beat them twice. No quarterback. They lost to Green Bay in overtime, 27-24. They lose to Miami to start the season. So, yeah, they can get some wins, but, again, can you put them all together consistently? And I say no. I, I agree. Again, I, uh, they were 3-3 three three division last year. I think they'll be lucky to be 2-4, and four, if not 1-5 and five in the division this year. And I... Uh, you said their over-under was at eight wins. I would definitely be pushing the unders on that one. So moving to the Jets. The, the Jets have everybody talking because of one name, and that's Aaron Rodgers. A everybody wants to see what Aaron Rodgers can do. And last year, the Jets finished 7-10. and 10. Sports Illustrated has them predicted winning 11 games this year. ESPN has their over under set at nine and a half. I, I could be wrong, but I think that they'll win eight. And, and that's, that's a guess because, okay, so you inject a lot of talent with Aaron Rodgers. You inject a lot of experience with Aaron Rodgers. Does the rest of the team use that and want to want to win? Well, it's, it's the same defense. Roughly, with a few additions, it's it's the same offensive line. And do you help him out enough? It's the same coach in Sala, which is decent. I'm, I'm not going to say good. Totally agree. I'm not going to say great. Right. So, I don't know. Uh, I will continue with your Jets, but I have them finishing second. I have Miami finishing third. Uh, I... I like the Jets as far as getting Aaron Rodgers, but 
you're coming with Brees Hall, who's coming off an ACL injury. You're bringing over Alan Lassard, who he threw to in Green Bay, so he has familiarity there, and they already have a great wide receiver already there, and their defense is extremely good. They won with third and fourth string quarterbacks. Their start of the season will tell it all. Game one, prime time, you got the Bills. Very next week, the three o'clock game, the matinee one, you have the Cowboys. Then you should write the ship and play the Patriots. See if you can be, if you steal a win between the Bills and Cowboys, you might be two and one. Then you are at home against the Chiefs. Then a gimme against the Broncos. And then you have the Eagles. So if they can come out of that at three and three, their schedule looks pretty easy after that, besides division games. I do think Aaron Rodgers is a difference maker. I will go 10 wins. I have them, like, again, I have them finishing second. Uh, <clears throat> it's Aaron. He's going to give you some scores, and that defense is really good. And, yes, I think the head coach will be outcoached uh, when you play the teams like the Bills, like the Cowboys, even the Chiefs. Um, but down the road, their schedule will get easier. But starting the season, it'll be a rough start, a lot like Tom Brady when he started in Tampa Bay. But finish strong. And then we'll have to see if they make the playoffs, how they rally around them. But I think the big key will be Brees Hall coming off the ACL, if uh, how strong he is. It's usually year two that they do great, not year one. But again, and it, Rogers throwing the ball, so they might not even run the ball 20 times a game. My mindset when I looked at this game, and that this game, when I looked at this team, I, I literally flipped a coin. I go, what's going to happen is... Aaron Rodgers is going to continue what he did last year at the Packers, which he had a down season. Very. He he had the lowest throwing percentage in a long time that he's had. He had a lot more interceptions, fewer touchdowns. Zero 300-yard games last year. Yeah. So I flipped a coin. I go, is it going to be the same thing that he did in Green Bay, or is he going to have some brand new energy because he's going to a different team? Yes. And I went back and forth with that. So I went, okay, yeah, he's going to have that new energy, but he's going to have a brand new coach. What I think helps on that energy is him and his coach in Green Bay weren't coffee drinking buddies. Oh, no. Whatever beer, what do you want to call it? But this coach in New New York is more that team uh, player friendly coach. And I think, not that they're going to be coffee drinking buddies, but I think there's more laughing, they're more relaxed. I think there's more give and take. Yes. In Green Bay, it was. you Maybe. will do what I tell you. I have small man syndrome. Listen uh, to me. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I definitely think he's going to be playing more relaxed, more fun, where Rodgers is like, I can be li- play a little more loose, be me, let things happen. And oh, by the way, they brought in, uh, oh, what's his name, the offensive coordinator that he got along with. Heck, yes, thank you. So they're already going to have familiarity on the plays there, so that will help us blit. Is it enough? To, to, right, to me, I think it is enough to finish second, 10 to 12 wins. I view that as a minus. You you bring in so many new pieces, you, you're going to have some some disconnect when it comes to the communication level. You're going to have some disconnect when it comes to what each coach wants you to do. And well, we're doing it this way. Oh, I thought you wanted to do it that way. And that's why I have them at eight. Okay. I, I could be completely wrong. Yeah. A Sports Illustrated could be completely right, and you could be completely right, and they finish second, and uh, he yeah. has a, like a Brett Favre season when he went to the Jets and almost got into the Super Bowl. And that's where I have Miami uh, is finishing at the eight. Uh, I have them finishing third behind Buffalo and New York. I don't believe in their head coach. I, I think Tua played some great games last year, but he showed who he really was at the end. You can blame concussions all you want or this and that. Uh, He was clear to play after the Cincinnati play, obviously. I'm talking about the last six, seven games of the season. Didn't do well. Was very mediocre, who I think that's the quarterback he is. And again, he has to play the Jets and Bills. Those could be four losses right there. Get two wins against uh, the Patriots, so... You're looking at two and four, maybe three and three in the division. And then outside, you know, they have the Panthers who are, you know, going to have a rookie quarterback. They got the Eagles. Um, They got Kansas City they got to play. So they got the Titans. They They, got the Cowboys. They have a tough schedule. Right. So they're the ones I have sitting down there at the eight and eight mark, uh, mainly because, again, they're between their head coach 
who I think is is young, but I don't, I'm not sure what credentials he had that said, you know what, dude, you're going to really make us to the promised land. And then you have two as your quarterback. You, yes, you have Tyreek Hill. You're going to have some explosive plays, but I don't, I don't think you're going to win more than eight or nine games. Tyreek Hill's name came up in the, the news here recently. Um, w- when I sat down and did this, I had them winning 10. They finished nine and eight last year. I think to a played a little scared after he had those concussion things. It, it, or maybe you're right. And that was who he is as a quarterback. Sports Illustrated has them predicted winning 11, which I think is, I don't Ooh. know, that's a stretch. Wow. ESPN sets their, their over unders on wins for the season at nine and a half. And it all depends on what happens. Does does Tyreek Hill and Tua get on the same page again? Do they have any sort of running game to take some pressure, pressure right? off Tua to give defenses guessing? If they do, that gets them to the 10. If they don't, then you're right. The Jets come in and take second away from the Dolphins. And that's why this is fun. It, it, it's a total guess. We don't know what happens. There could be some key injuries to any one of these teams, which I'm not wanting to happen. I want some good football. It's just the the variables that we don't know that can happen and will happen. Yeah, I, I think his weapons around him are very good. Uh, I just think it comes down to, you know, late game execution and, you know, needing that driver, needing to stop. And I, you know, I, I would take Aaron Rodgers over needing that drive and the Jets defense needing that stop over... To, uh, in the Miami defense. And I don't like their coach. Yeah. I, yeah. Some, I said, I don't, I don't know what his credentials were to steal that job, but he beat somebody out that I don't, yeah. After, after Tua had his second incident on the field where you see his hands like going in all different directions, and that is an indicator that you're having neural trauma, brain trauma, because your, your hands like go all crazy on you. And, they listen to Tua and they let him campaign to come back in where the coaches should have stepped in and said, you're an important piece. We should err on the side of caution. Your health is more important than these one or two wins that you can get us. We want you healthy. No, they threw him back in. Yeah. And that's, that's where I lost a lot of respect for the Dolphins coach. Well, yeah, and he said, well, the doctor said this and that. No, 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 dude, you're the head coach. Okay, I hear what you're saying, and you're saying he's good, and he passed all your tests in the back. But let's wait until tomorrow and see how he is. We're not going to take, we're not going to risk putting him back in today. Right. And I, yeah, you're right, hundred percent. It was on the coach. So. So it sounds like we both have the Bills, tops of the East AFC. Yeah. And it's a lot like to me, like Kansas City. Uh, I can't really knock the Bills off until someone does, and you Bill fans. Good luck because, again, they, a team that hasn't really helped themselves out, Buffalo has not got any more receiving weapons for uh, Josh Allen on that. Running games, this and that. I mean, pretty much Josh has got to will this team to win. I, I mean, there was a lot of talk of Diggs leaving the team because, uh, you know, hey, no one's – not, we're not helping to try to win. You got Gabe Davis who's really good. You obviously have Stephon Diggs. Uh yeah, Braylon Johnson coming in. Keyshawn Johnson, who hasn't seen the field. Uh, and I, who's this? Ty- Tyrell Shavers will be another young one. But other than that, there's no one here that's going to take away a double team or triple team even from Stefan Diggs so that Josh can get him the ball. And then running back, there's rumors, again, between Miami, <laughs> obviously the AFC East, Miami, the Bills and the Jets. Jets are minor because of Brees Hall, but all looking at Dalvin Cook, who gets him? If the Bills can steal Dalvin Cook, it's huge. That To me, that puts him in that 13-14 win category. Right now, I have him sitting around 12. Um, Just, I mean, they have their normal. Damian Harris is their main guy at the running back, but he's not a deal, you know, a 15-yard, a 100-yard guy or whatever. I, they, I think they should definitely go kind of all in and get Dalvin Cook. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins would be nice if you package them two together and give Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, DeAndre Hopkins, and you have a Dalvin Cook. 
you might be telling Kansas City and Cincinnati, hello, we're ready this year. I also have them at 12. They finished 13-3 and three last year. Sports Illustrated has them predicted to win 11. And ESPN's writers have their over-unders set at 10.5 for the season. I, oh, man. You have, you have the Jets' first game. And no matter how good a team is, the very first game is always kind of a crapshoot. Fact. And you're in New York, so... Prime time, 7 o'clock. Yeah, yep. it's a Monday night game. It's always You always have those Monday night jitters because it is in prime time, and you have the whole day to think about it. Oh, man, you're watching all these other games, and you're getting hyped, and you get down, then you get hyped, and then you're just waiting for... You know, it's 1 in the afternoon, you're like, I don't even play for five more hours. Right. You know? Their next game, Vegas, should be a gimme. Yeah. Washington, I don't have any faith in Washington doing anything this yep. year. Miami, we'll give them a tough game, but I think they should win that. Jacksonville, we'll definitely give them a tough game, yep. but I think they should win it. The Giants, yep. if the Giants continue to do what they did last year, we'll give them a tough game, but they should win. Yeah, those first, what, six games you just mentioned, easily could be 5-1. and one. Say they lose that first one of the Jets on a close one. Rodgers gets that final drive and puts the Jets on Super Bowl notice. Uh, you're right. Those next four are very winnable. Even if they drop one to either the Dolphins or the Jaguars, I don't think they'll lose both. One of the, might lose one. They're still sitting at four and two to start a season, right? Which is really well. And obviously, they might actually be six and zero oh with very minimal weapons. But I said if they get either Hopkins or Cook, that to me they were five and one, six and zero oh right away. But if they don't make any moves, I could see them sitting at four and two after those first six. But sitting in first in that division and looking good. And then moving forward, you have to go on the road to Cincinnati. You play the Jets again. You play the Eagles. At the Eagles, yep. And you, at the Chiefs. You play in Kansas City. You get to come home to play the Cowboys. And then you go to L.A. to play the Chargers. And you finish your season at Miami. So they have a tough, tough schedule, but I still have them 12 wins. Yeah, yeah, they're the kind of opposite of the Jets. Uh, their front is pretty manageable to build up some wins. And then, yeah, at the end of the season where you hope to be clicking, playing the Chiefs, Cowboys, Chargers, you, you'd you hope by those three games that you're you're healthy for one, obviously. That goes without saying. But you're clicking and you're finding a groove of what you want to do offensively where it comes down to that Patriots-Dolphins series where you're like, you know what? We don't need to be all in. We already have our position. Kind of rest here and there and, you know, finish the season. Fairly easy games to where it's not a lot of stress on the staff. But I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait. This is going to be a fun season. This will be a fun... It, for for a lot of reasons, uh, one, to see where Dalvin Cook goes, he can make a lot of teams a lot better or yeah. he can get hurt and then it really doesn't matter. And Aaron Rodgers. I really want to see what happens. I want to see if all of the talk that he said, well, I want to go somewhere else, it'll make all the difference. If that rejuvenates his career or if he trails off. So my question for you, James, next week when we do this, when we do NFC, what two divisions are we going to do? Are we going to do North-South? Yeah. North-South? Yeah, definitely North-South. I, I, I would like to do the East last, so we'll do North-South first. And uh, we got a lot of Minnesota, a lot of Detroit, a lot of Green Bay fans out there. So, yeah, that we'll give them their taste early. Um, they might not like what we have to say. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but, yeah, and again, I think the AFC comes down to the usual suspects, uh, the Cincinnati, Buffalo, Kansas City. I might definitely throw Baltimore in the mix this year with uh, Lamar Jackson if he obviously stays there the whole time. And, uh, you know, who knows with Tennessee, uh, what they do coming out of the South, that they can actually make noise. But, you know, look for the Cincinnati. I'll say the Ravens this time, Kansas City and Bills, and maybe Buffalo can pull it through this year. I don't want to make that statement yet. Let's see what how we get through the preseason before I make my Super Bowl predictions. Yeah, I have I have two teams, and two of them are tied for the second. So I have three teams tied for... Oh, come on, Daryl. Choose your words better. <laughs> Three teams 
are at the top of the AFC. Chiefs are one, and tied for second are the the Bills and the Bengals. See, I, I have uh, the Ravens there, the Ravens and the Bills. Um, I, actually, I have the Bills ahead of the Chiefs, and I'll have the Ravens and Kansas City sitting at a close, close second. All right, season, hurry up and get here. Man, we're, on, we're only like uh, 78. 77, I don't have the... I'll, I'll try to get the count by next week, see exactly where we're at, but we're sitting pretty good on days away. We are. The, the season's right around the corner. It's yes. amazing. And we are at that point where we have some final thoughts, and I'm going to give you one quick funny quote before we go into your final thoughts. Right. And it came from Pete Rose. I'd be willing to bet you, if I was a betting man, that I have never bet on baseball. <laughs> That's your Pete Rose quote. Was he a player at the time? Yeah. Because that would be great. I don't I don't know exactly uh, when he said it, but one more time. Pete Rose said, I'd be willing to bet you if I was a betting man that I have never bet on baseball. Is if in capital with quotes? If I wasn't a Why player. would he say that? <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, man. That's a good uh, one, Pete. Well, speaking of Pete Rose, uh, on this day, 1984, those of you that don't know, he played for the Montreal Expos, Montreal Expos. He played for a record 3,309th Major League game, surpassing Carl Jaskimski of the Red Sox, which is huge because, uh, you know, when you look at uh, Cal Ripken's consecutive games played and all that, it's just, and now you can't get a guy that plays 100 days. You know what I'm saying? These guys are playing 3,000 plus days, 4,000 games. It's it's nuts. Uh, also, in 1994, in the NBA draft, since the draft just happened in the NBA, we had the old big dog, Glenn Robinson, was the first pick by the Milwaukee Bucks. Oh, wow. Yeah, 1994. Glenn Big Baby Robinson. Big dog. Oh, big dog. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the other the one. Dog. Right, yes. The other Glenn Robinson. The other one, yep. And then uh, George Foreman loses his title because he refused to refight Axel Schultz. And if I remember right, I apologize, I've got this wrong. And I want to say it came down to money and scheduling. And yeah, they took his title from him because he didn't defend it in uh, X amount of days. So one of those few things that was in 1995. And uh, I remember old Axel Schultz. But that is your day in history. So. I have two quotes, and then I'll give you um, a tidbit. So Charles Barkley, I'm going to miss the NBA TNT broadcast until the next NBA season, but Charles Barkley. I heard Tanya Harding is calling herself the Charles Barkley of figure skating. You know, I was going to sue her for defamation of character, but then I realized I have no character. <laughs> All right, that's your funny one. And oh, then Charles is awesome. He is. He is. I have I have one here from Peyton Manning. And Peyton Manning said, I've never left the field saying, oh, I could have done more to get ready. And that gives me peace of mind because he always prepared. Right. And isn't the saying you leave it all on the field? You don't want to be walking on the field. Oh, I should have ran a little faster. I should have grabbed or reached out. No, no, no. You leave it all on the field so there isn't none of that second guessing. Yeah. Right. And my final thoughts are a look ahead to a boxing match, July 29th. We have Omaha native Terrence. Bud Crawford taking on Errol Spence Jr. in Las Vegas. It's a pay-per-view match, but I can't wait for this. I want I, This should be an amazing fight. And yeah, I'm pulling for Bud, but if Errol Spence Jr. is in amazing shape and comes out, this, this could go the distance and it's anybody's match. Oh, yeah, definitely. I can't wait. All right. For Blue Collar Sports Talk, I've got James here. See ya. I'm Daryl. Go watch some sports.